Okay, welcome everyone to the last session of the day. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, we're going to be talking with Scott Armstrong uh, as well as Anthony Pileschi. And we're going to be talking about existing buildings, how to shockproof your building through decarbonized capital planning. Uh, Scott Armstrong is, a passion, is passionate about buildings, their design and construction, ongoing performance, deterioration and failure, and ultimately their renewal. A building science specialist and certified engineering technologist, Scott successfully bridges the traditional gap between architecture and engineering disciplines and is frequently invited to speak publicly on topics such as enclosure design, high performance building design and existing building retrofits. Anthony is the practice leader of WSP's Canadian building performance analysis team with, fi with 15 years of experience in the field. He specializes in the design sim simulation and evaluation of building energy efficiency measures with experience leading teams towards high performance buildings in all major sectors. His broader consulting expertise includes enclosure design, energy and water measurement and verification, indoor air quality design, and environmental life cycle assessment. Uh, I've worked with both of these gentlemen on several occasions and I'm very much looking forward to this session. So thanks for joining us today and uh, over to you guys. Thanks Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I'm going to start us off again. Thank you very much for having us at the session. And um, I used to not like going last, but it's very it's a pleasure now to close out the day um, and apply this uh, some of this learning that we've talked about today to existing buildings. So. Uh, again, thank you for your time and um, I hope you've enjoyed the day and, and enjoy the last 45 minutes that we have here together. Next. Um, so we're just going to look back uh, a number of years uh, in London, the Great Smog event, um, which killed many people in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and it's interesting to look at the years of this. So 1952, this occurred. By 1956, restrictions are, had already been um, uh, mandated by the Clean Air Act. Um, so we know that quick action is possible uh, when there is great need. Next. We also know that the evolutionary social transformation um, is a known path. We, we know how to do this. We've, we've explored it. We've executed it many times. Next. And we know that there are certain aspects of our work that apply to each of these stages, whether that is the science, which is also well established, the design process, which we're also very familiar with and has been explored through all of the sessions today, and the governance, which we'll talk as well about today. It's not rocket science, but it's quite likely that rocket scientists do also use this approach. Next. So why is it any different for global climate action? Next. We're going to chat briefly about the current policy context and uh, I won't, I'll go through this quickly because we've talked a lot about it already today. Um, the first one is the, uh, the general scenario planning, which many people are very familiar with, looking at um, future climate scenarios and the potential for warming. Uh, and Lloyd's uh, topic uh, presentation today was a great way to kick off the day. Um, exploring what that 1.5 degree lifestyle looks like. Next, we're going to zoom into the, um, the the 2020 to 2040 uh, and ultimately that net zero goal. Um, this is what that 65 or 67 percent chance scenario looks like. So, taking a, uh, either the aggressive 65 percent approach by 2030. Um, ultimately getting us to that 2040 net zero or zero CO2 emissions goal uh, will take a lot. Um, we, have, we have done a lot of work, um, but this is still a very steep graph uh, and a lot of work needs to be done. We do know too that the, um, the COP26 goals are fairly clear. Uh, we need to secure global uh, commitment to net zero for the 1.5 degrees C. We need to adapt to protect habitat um, and we need to mobilize finance while also working together to deliver on these commitments. Next. I also, uh, Anthony put this in for us. Um, the reason that I think Greta makes us so uncomfortable, which the Atlantic describes very well in this article, is because she speaks 
uncomfortable truths and there there are things that we have to do and we know it's a it's a very uh, big challenge but um if there's if there's um, something we're doing here today it's it's to try to respond to that challenge so i encourage everyone to continue to do the great work that you are doing next on the federal side uh, the government has committed to a number of binding targets um, they have set a price on carbon which we're all familiar with and those were reinforced uh, in the recent election um, and there are also further commitments to tighter targets and to um, more disclosures on the financial side, as well as uh, commitments to developing strategies in all sectors. Next. The federal plan for existing buildings is not dissimilar. Um, it's important to note that, you know, a, a lot of the best existing building practices for achieving decarbonization come from the new building net zero work that we do in, in the sector. Um, so, applying them to existing buildings can sometimes be a greater challenge although i know in our experience with multi-unit residential buildings a lot of that older stock have uh, a much more modest window to wall ratio for example so there's lots of opaque wall to insulate very well and make air tight um, and so it's not necessarily a, a, a bigger challenge for existing buildings but it's just a slightly different challenge we know that net zero in existing buildings requires a lot of funding um, there are several uh, organizations that will that support this work. The, uh, the FCM, um, there's Enercan for homes, uh, and there's also the uh, CIB uh, for large institutional, uh, industrial, and commercial buildings. Next, um, and as I mentioned, the carbon tax. The carbon tax is a is definitely an incentive. Um, which is a meaningful signal towards uh, encouraging fuel switching. Um, when you start uh, paying for the pollution, for when you start paying for carbon, um, that you can see that trend line eventually going up and crossing that $300 a ton threshold. Um, and the quick calculation at the top there, uh, keeping all other factors the same, the a price of electricity to natural gas of around two to one is the point at which fuel switching becomes um, uh, economically the, the same, essentially. So um, the, the cost for electricity in Ontario currently is much higher than natural gas. So fuel switching becomes, is a bit less attractive from a financial perspective, although the carbon benefit is there. Um, but as that carbon tax continues to increase, and even at $170 a ton, it gets closer and closer to that two to one ratio. Uh, and there is that federal backstop to 2030 uh, to have the carbon tax um, at $170 per ton. Um, the other thing I'll mention in this particular graph is that, you know, that uh, that dotted line of uh, of the projection going up and and to the right is a forecast. Um, and so, in a lot of our work, we're analyzing that regulatory risk with clients. Uh, it's quite possible that that line could get steeper. Uh, it could get shallower, but it could also get steeper. Um, so it's important to think about um, where the trend is going, uh, as well as you know what the risk is on both sides of that trend. Next, the provincial government, um, you know, we've there's been a lot of success since 2005, uh, 40 billion dollars in capital investments. There's been major decarbonization of the of the electrical grid, which again has been the lion's share of the benefit to existing assets. So many, many existing assets have claimed significant carbon savings. A lot of those carbon savings are coming from the grid um, and the greening of the grid. Um, not to say that uh, retrofits have not played their part, but um, the, recent, uh, the recent freeze on spending for conservation programs was obviously a bit, uh, well, more than a bit perhaps, but uh, disappointing. Um, and uh, we do hope to see that restored soon. Um, but again, we need to analyze the regulatory risk and what um, what the potential cost of not retrofitting or not decarbonizing remains to existing buildings. Next, it's interesting to look at. Uh, you know, again, this just reiterates the the decarbonization of of the Ontario grid, um, and we'll I'll touch on this briefly in a couple of slides when we talk about the city of Toronto specifically. Next. The City of Toronto uh, has its own targets. Um, we we've uh, we've helped them recently on uh, on the um, 
sorry, the zero carbon existing building strategy, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, but what I find quite compelling is this mandate from even transform TO in 2017, um, 100% of existing buildings being retrofitted uh, with, an, with an average savings or an average performance improvement of 40%. So if you achieve 40% on an existing building retrofit, that, that's, that's fantastic, but it, it's, it's not enough if everyone does that. Well, I should say it is enough if everyone does it, but not everyone's gonna be able to achieve that. So some people are gonna have to achieve much, much better than 40% improvement. Um, and so that's the challenge uh, because we know certain buildings um, there may be logistical reasons that they cannot be retrofitted to achieve 40 or 50 or 60 percent. Um, other buildings are in a position to, to achieve much, much deeper, uh, deeper savings. Next. Um, and as that Ontario electricity grid decarbonization chart shows, um, the City of Toronto's emission reductions have been largely mirroring that trend. Uh, very steep downward as a result of the decarbonization of the grid, plus some other um, emissions reduction strategies by the city. Uh, when the city declared their climate emergency in 2019, um, it set the it set the boundary around the next set of projection projected uh, decreases in carbon emissions. You can see the interim 65% reduction by 2030, and then ultimately the net zero target in 2050. Next. The city staff was asked uh, to come up with a plan to implement this strategy, um, which came out in July, uh, and sorry, was approved in July. Um, and really, it, it uh, it's not um, it's it's not a difficult process to understand. Uh, you first need to report. You need to know what the where the emissions are uh, and how significant they are, and in which buildings. Um, it's important to set standards so that everyone is working towards the same goal. Uh, to audit buildings and to recommission them to make sure they're operating optimally. There's a huge amount of education. This this conference being you know one avenue, there are many avenues by which we need to get the word out uh, to existing building owners to to encourage them in their decarbonization path. I just finished a meeting. I jumped out of one session. I went into a meeting with a client to talk about a, a decarbonization strategy for um, several of their multi-unit residential buildings and back in here sort of spreading the word. So any opportunity we have to kind of share the decarbonization message uh, is important. And then setting that strategy. Uh, we don't get anywhere without setting a strategy. Um, the, one, the first habit of uh, highly effective people is doing first things first. So first things first is setting a strategy. Next. Uh, city staff also developed a bit of a timeline uh, for implementing these strategies. The targets themselves are not set but at least um, the general framework of when these practices, when these requirements will come into effect uh, are being provided. Next. And these stem from uh, key findings, which uh, were reported in a, a document put together uh, by ourselves, WSP, uh, with Integral, with Windfall and with REAP. Um, you can download this from the city's website. Um, and we're gonna to touch on a few of these, uh, these aspects. Um, the, the one that I wanna focus on on this particular slide is the, the enclosure upgrade. Um, that, is, that is my area of, of specialism. Um, it's certainly something that I care a lot about, you heard in my bio introduction. Um, and, and I know that good enclosures enable uh, good HVAC systems and enable uh, the types of low carbon solutions that we need. So fuel switching and grid optimization, enclosure upgrades, uh, financial support, um, and the power for mandates, which the city currently doesn't have in some aspects. So those were the key recommendations. Next. This report includes some high level scenarios, um, looking at the baseline and then stepping through three different options uh, for improvements. Um, and it co covers every aspect of the building uh, from the enclosure to uh, the active systems to see what those um, scenarios look like um, and uh, and how they can contribute to decarbonization. Next, we'll get into the details on this. Uh, putting those together in, in packages, you can see um, how uh, the, the path to zero carbon ready or this max site potential uh, can be a bit of a step process. And I'll jump right into the next slide. Um, the, the key being 
which of these packages really drives down the emissions, uh, the emissions for a particular building. And ultimately, you want to get below that, uh, that 80% reduction, but certainly there may be an interim step at the 50% to get us to that 2030 goal. Um, knowing that we're being mindful of not locking yourself into a higher carbon scenario. So making sure that that is a, a fully decarbonization, full decarbonization strategy that takes you to zero, but may have an interim step uh, at a 50% reduction. Next. And then overlaying these different scenarios with that timeline, you can see when some of these um, activities may take place between now uh, and 2050 or 2045. Um, and you can see the options of fuel switching and enclosure measures um, being uh, staged uh, at different different points in the building's life cycle. Next. So let's drive down to uh, facility specific actions uh, before I turn things over to Anthony. Next. We have four key topics that we want to talk about. Uh, as I mentioned, I want to talk about supportive enclosures. We have a few case studies. Um, we're going to talk about occupant connected systems and equipment and how that really helps to drive uh, decarbonization. Um, optimal fuel switching, so doing it where it makes sense um, and what that looks like in existing buildings, and then grid stewardship. Next. We're going to focus on the enclosure first. Uh, Passive House Institute, I think, has one of the best graphics for showing uh, the um, key aspects of enclosure, of, of high performance building enclosures. Um, and we know that the, the, a good enclosure is absolutely critical to enabling low energy systems that uh, are also uh, low carbon. Um, so we need good thermal insulation, we need a thermal bridge free design, uh, we need air tightness, um, and, and we need to do um, uh, smart ventilation. Uh, so the, the HVAC and the enclosure are absolutely integrated systems. They depend upon each other and the success of the project depends on them working well together. Next. When thinking about holistic retrofits, you can step to the next uh, next slide. There, there's always um, there's almost always some overlap with active systems and passive systems, um, and it's possible that we could um, miss the first window of holistic opportunity, which we probably have on many buildings. But we likely have another scenario, another holistic opportunity coming up now and and into the next ten years where a lot of our existing building assets um, may have, I, I've sort of shown HVAC systems uh, with in kind of like 10 year increments there. So you can limp along an existing HVAC system, you can limp along an existing enclosure to a certain extent. Um, at some point, there, co there comes a time when holistic retrofit is possible. Next. Um, it was shared earlier too, this idea of the, the circular building. Um, we think about buildings in this way uh, when we think about capital planning, uh, when we think about repair and restoration, and ultimately to renewal. Next, but what I like to think about is taking this and putting it in a linear form. Um, our assumption or our, our uh, thinking might be that this is a, a fairly um, equal part journey along a path for a particular building next. But what we usually end up is, is this prolonged uh, local problems uh, solving situation next. And it's often an iterative process where we're just kind of chasing leaks or uh, fixing or uh, maybe recommissioning or replacing pumps next. When we start to get into the restore next and the renew stage and we overlay next the, the climate parameters that we know we're gonna be facing in the near future Next, we have a very serious question on our hands. How do we address existing buildings? How do existing buildings respond to the climate emergency? And how do we uh, mitigate the climate emergency by adapting those same buildings in a decarbonized way? Next. Uh, there are frameworks uh, through which we can do this kind of analysis. Um, the PIVC is something that many people are familiar with. Next, just a quick zoom in on um, taking each of the components within a building. I focused here on roofing, uh, overlaying that with the climate parameter and how that climate parameter will affect that element. Next. Um, and then looking at some of the um, consequences of that climate parameter and how it will, be will affect 
it will affect the uh, component as well as um, be affected by failure of the component. Um, and then whether deciding using this framework to decide which elements require a deeper engineering analysis to come up with some kind of mitigation or adaptation strategy. Next. Uh, a few slides before I uh, pass off to Anthony for the, um, for the final stages. A few projects we want to talk about. We have one commercial project here. Many people are familiar with 77 Bloor Street West. Um, this is an existing office building in downtown Toronto at Bay and Bloor. Um, I think it's about a 17-story building, fairly typical commercial office. Uh, had a $500,000 uh, savings from this deep retrofit. You can see down the left-hand side the features of that particular retrofit. Next, yep, 30% GHG reductions and water savings. And the PS to resistance in this particular project, one entirely new occupiable floor at the top of the building. Um, it's uh, there are there are reasons we put mechanical systems on the tops of buildings, but they certainly get the best views. So when we can take them out and put in windows um, and and allow people to be up there, uh, there's a pretty significant benefit. Um, when you talk about return on investment as well, uh, it's not very often that you get to add uh, a new floor essentially for free into an existing building. So that certainly goes well uh, to the to the payback for a building. Next. Uh, the Ontario Association of Architects headquarters here in Toronto as well um, is a, another great example of uh, both a sequential and then a, a sort of step deep retrofit uh, of an existing building. So this building had seen some retrofits over the over a number of years. Um, the curtain wall, for example, had been retrofitted, I think, with fiberglass pressure plates and and some uh, improved glazing. Um, but then we we went in with a deeper retrofit, which was um, some dynamic glazing, uh, exterior enclosure upgrades, a fully modernized HVAC system, um, uh, as well as um, uh, some ground source. Um, I think we did some cooling, uh, heating and cooling storage in the ground for this particular project. Um, and then uh, what's not readily available, and I don't have a, an image of the final I need to update this slide, that reminds me, but um, that, that nice grid on the roof of this building, uh, when this building was built, uh, it was originally conceived of to, to hold solar panels, um, but at the time they were too expensive and so they were not put on the building. Um, as a result of this deep retrofit and as the significant reduction in the cost for solar panels, um, there are now a, there's a now a full solar array on the roof of this building. So again, further uh, improving the, the carbon emissions for this particular building. And then lastly, a multi-unit residential project. I'll just touch on briefly. There are there are huge opportunities in Toronto. Um, we've done a few tower renewal projects. Um, there are examples in Hamilton of passive house retrofit of multi-unit residential buildings. Um, the, uh, the possibilities are endless. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short there and, and to give Anthony enough time to carry on. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and I think a lot of the things that Scott has said set me up to be pretty quick and walk through some of these other concepts and get to your questions because we're really anxious to hear people's thoughts too. So we talked about those occupant connected systems and equipment. You know, it's, it's something we talk about all the time. You know. We want to sense occupancy and we want those occupancy sensors to control lighting, HVAC equipment and other equipments within the system. We want occupants to be engaged. We want them to have feedback. And these are the things that we're recommending in new construction as well, because they're the cheap and easy things to make changes to. They're the things that are renewed perhaps more often, or at least, you know, things like activity based workplace and, and controls can be can change as the space changes. And we're probably at that time these days when a lot of people are thinking, even in, especially in the office sector, for example, about you know, what is it that we wanna do with our space? So that presents another one of those opportunities to, to make change and, and get existing buildings ready. I just pulled this uh, out uh, from my friend, Victor, who tracks energies for our Kitchener office, just to point out that, you know, we, we, we've been tracking energy use um, for, for our office for a long time. We think it's a great building where we were, you know, Obviously, 2020 was the best year of energy performance in this building ever, you know, mostly because there was nobody there. But I think it says something about, you know, I've, I've spoken to others who have said, oh, well, our buildings didn't really decrease in energy use because we kept all of our systems ready for occupants, even though they weren't there. So heating systems were on, lighting was on, 
et cetera, for normal occupied periods. And if you can't, in a lot of buildings, if you don't have those uh, occupant responsive systems, you can't, you know, you can't reduce your energy use when there aren't people there. So an important um, sort of basic concept, but it can't be done on its own. You can't just install the systems and expect the building to be smart. It is really about being vigilant, having people focused on performance. The concept of monitoring base commissioning is key there. So uh, I, I, I want to do a whole lecture, 45 minutes on optimal fuel switch. Um, so I'll just, I want to just introduce the concept to you. It is something we sort of see as, you know, it's, it's in quotes here because I've never seen any retrofit project or new construction project be, be optimal in the traditional sense. We use techniques to think about optimization, but really what I mean here is let's reduce the loads enough uh, so that we can choose from the right mix of fuels that allow us to get to a zero carbon facility. And, you know, it's about you know, the occupant connected systems and the enclosure um, and the HVAC improvements we want to do, like putting in um, uh, heat recovery, review, renewing our HVAC systems so they're easier to control. That allows us to reduce the peak load and allow for the systems that are already there, piping and ductwork, to be reused in a maximum way. And, and I'll show you in a sec, allows us to connect to heat pumps more effectively and deliver more energy from heat pumps. Then we have to make a choice. We have to figure out, you know, what is the future market going to be for natural gas? If it's renewable, what's the renewable gas option? Is there, you know, hydrogen in there? What about electricity? It seems expensive, but you know, efficient as an option through heat pumps. Biomass is an opportunity, and there's a partnership with Enwave and other district energy providers in Toronto that is an opportunity for a lot of buildings. So, a lot of the exploration is about what is that mix of fuels. And just as a comment, you know, you can have a building where, as we bring in outdoor air mix it with, with the circulated air in a standard compartmental box here, heat and cool it, we deliver it hot because we have all this glass um, and these lights to deal with in this building to maintain a 21 degree temperature. And in order to achieve that, we need 60 degrees C or you know, 180 degrees C water to be circulating to our, our, through our pipes. But if we do all the things we need to do, you know, put in heat recovery, um, you know, it, we can't necessarily put our pipes in our ceiling. That's a new construction concept, but there are analogs to that in, in existing building retrofits. We can deliver our ventilation separately um, to maintain. We can improve, you know, we can't necessarily reduce our window to wall ratio, but the great thing that Scott mentioned is that existing buildings already have small window to wall ratios, and so we're in good shape. We can do all these things and we can get to a much lower supply temperature, maybe not 27, but maybe 40 or 45, and that's a much better temperature set point um, for what we need to do. Now there may be silver bullet heat pumps that are going to come along that generate super high temperature water, but right now they're not here and they're not readily available in the market. So we, if we want to take advantage of these high uh, COPs, these high performance levels for air source heat pumps and geo exchange, we need to use um, these ways of reducing, uh, we need to get that optimization from the enclosure. Um, and just as a comment, you know, the sense is that RNG, when it's, once it is available, is going to be pretty expensive. You know, natural gas is pretty cheap right now, and electricity is a lot more expensive. You know, if you're in New York, you probably aren't happy about your electricity bill at all. But in Canada, it's actually pretty cheap to get electricity. So um, but the opportunities there are, are, are still a challenge. So the ratio, the cost that Scott showed between gas and electricity is is pretty tough and that's what makes using electricity hard on the long term. The other concept that we talked about is grid stewardship and um, uh, just quickly go through these these points that you know there is precedent in Ontario for the grid operator and occupant and buildings working together. It's one of the only places in Canada where we've had real partnership for a long time. That can be something we innovate on here. Um, optimal fuel switch helps to make this work so we don't increase our peak demand on the grid, but you know, how are we going to avoid as we ask for lots more electricity? Well, can we align this idea that we're needing vehicle charging? There's opportunity for rooftop solar and other renewable energy and the electrification problem together. And how can we make a case to grid providers for that? And you know, more microgrids also means more a more climate resilient grid. So the more we can handle power needs locally, the easier it is for grid operators in those tough situations too. So um, I think I can get through this quick, so I'll just I'm gonna I'm gonna get just so that we have the right amount of time. Um, this was an interesting study done by the Canadian Gas Association. I've summarized it here in a graphic. 
Um, actually, courtesy of the CAGBC, they allowed me to do a lecture about this topic a while ago. So check out their great series of zero carbon lectures, plug for them. Um, but this slide is a great, uh, I, I, I prepped for that presentation. What it says is that the CGA had ICF uh, figure out, well, here's the current demand of power in 2020, 113 gigawatts. If we, if we only do fuel switching in all buildings across Canada, we're going to need a lot more power to do that fuel switching. Air source heat pumps only. Yeah, there will be some savings. So we, you know, some heat pump, some buildings that are electrically heated will get worse. Um, or sort of will get better. They'll have heat pumps now instead of electric resistance. We'll also try for some efficiency, but we're really multiplying, you know, really increasing the demand for electricity by doing this. In fact, it's worse than that because if we want to use renewable energy only to generate that electricity and we need all these other battery storage and other storage options, wow, we're going to increase our demand, our, our demand by 1.5 times to do all of that. But then um, the Canadian Gas Association got followed up by the Ontario Geothermal Association who said, hey, what if we use geoexchange instead of air source heat pumps as the way of meeting that those needs? And um, Dunsky did some work for them, which I, which is really great. And it sort of shows that, you know, when you look at all the different parts of the cost, the fuel cost, incremental equipment, electrical costs, these are more or less, you know, cancel each other out. But that 1.5 times multiplier in the peak demand impact of geoexchange, which has a better peak uh, performance than, than um, air source heat pumps do, uh, we can save almost half a billion dollars just by with that one measure being part of the decision. And you know, we've studied buildings where there are lots of different parts, especially the enclosure that hugely affect peak demand that allow us to reduce that peak. And this, this graph shows, you know, we had a, this is the OAA project again, it's the zero line. If we make walls worse, well, our peak demand in the summer goes up. Um, so if we make windows worse, our peak demand goes up by a similar amount. If we have higher lighting power density and plugs, those occupant base loads, those have a huge impact on the peak demand as does you know, using a boiler, um, you know, using a chiller, sorry, that's not as good as our geo exchange design. So you can see how um, there's really a flip. Uh, there's a lot of contributing factors anyways to designing for low peak demand. And then we can also work um, with battery storage, our PV system and those changes in demand that come from an optimal fuel switch design. And we can actually design a system that, you know, this was the old curve here that has a high peak in the summer and a low peak in the winter. Well, we can get down to this other level where we're not really increasing the peak demand in the winter and we're really reducing it in the summer so that we really remove the grid operators worry about how this building is going to you know, fit into that future. I think that's a really great opportunity. It's a new modeling problem, I call it, um, which we can engage in. So. Quickly in just like four minutes. I think we have about 10 minutes left. Is that accurate, Mike? I, I think um, so. I'll just do four minutes on how we do Sounds capital great. planning now. Yeah, it's just great. It's just really quickly. So all of this comes together. It's not just about the technologies and the strategies and how we're going to address, you know, this solve the problems at each building. It's also about, you know, how do we do broader capital planning across our asset over time? Like I said, there's no silver bullets. We have to rely on the science design and planning and governance to help us make it all work. So some of the things that we know are true is, you know, setting a minimum target for our project and using life cycle cost per ton thinking is really helpful. We've learned from the federal government who's doing a great job on that. Align with and if possible influence incentives. We're working on a project right now that the city and the, the atmospheric fund were willing to start thinking about a new loan arrangement and new funding opportunities because they were willing to come forward with a with a, a decarbonized uh, problem for them. So there's lots of opportunity to influence that funding. Look at the portfolio neighborhood scale as opportunities and then iterate as much as possible. And um, I'm not gonna get into the details of life cycle cost planning. That's a whole other workshop as well. And we studied it at length um, for, a lot of, for a lot of projects. But the idea is to just think of, oh, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't spend all this money. This is all we were planning to spend in the black box here. We shouldn't spend all this money on an, an aggressive retrofit, but if it helps us reduce our emissions and our energy cost now and leaves us with no no significant projects to do over the medium term and the city's willing to help finance that and there's an incentive oh well maybe that opportunity does have a better long-term cost for us we should look at all of those pieces together 
as one you know, financial analysis. There are lots of sources of funding and we're really excited to see the city stepping up. Um, the LC3 partnership is a great thing. Uh, the Atmospheric Fund, you know, basically getting money from the federal government through FCM to be able to target projects at, and target programs even at the project level, really trying to drive action forward quickly. FCM also has their own programs. There was this great new program that came out just before the election um, from Infrastructure Canada that was supporting um, community buildings. And Enbridge is now allowing you to do savings by design on your deep retrofit projects, which is excellent. That's a good way to get people like Scott to come help you out, um, you know, to, to think about your design and how to make it right. So, um, and we're excited that there are also a lot of finance, all these people are also doing financing and the Canada Infrastructure Bank, as Scott mentioned, has a great program for large buildings, which is which is um, developing, being developed right now. And well, is developed and is, you know, sort of rolling out right now. Maybe I'll just quickly say that, you know, neighborhood and portfolio scale prioritization is critical. Um, you can help improve cost effectiveness, uh, resilience opportunities and education beyond just what is needed. And I'm sure there were lots of discussion today. I wasn't able to attend everything, but that critical idea of us getting on board with this plan, that 1.5 degree lifestyle is, is really, you know, is promoted by having your neighbors also engaged in that. And there's lots of opportunities there. It's hard to work together, um, but still important. And then the portfolio scale also promotes timely action. Um, you know, you don't, you, you, can, you can fit things in at the right time if you're looking at the whole portfolio, address the lowest hanging fruit to compensate in other places, potentially balance costs across your assets. And then also look at how that operationalizes uh, carbon action within your organization and then lets you act as a leader, not just at a building, but at the portfolio scale, which is really important. Um, but don't forget that you have occupants and they need to be listened to. And then just that we have worked now through a number of projects that have gone through a variety of stages, sort of back to this whole concept that, you know, we're gonna test, check, act, deliver, um, you know, design, plan, construct, check, uh, see if we're achieving that target. We can do that in our analysis process too. We can use up front even, we can look at archetypal results to feed into high level studies of our facilities or across our portfolio. Then when we're ready for a facility, we can do a more detailed plan or really start down that retrofit pathway. And all these things feed into each other and they also allow us in the industry to feed it back to our archetypal understanding and you know really find those strategies and solutions that are gonna work best. Again, no silver bullets, but design can be that tool. You know, we can we can find those things that work well for this size of MERB, this type of enclosure design, as Scott was suggesting, this delivery, this, you know, this implementation of heat pumps, you know, and all those strategies can come together the more we iterate on this problem. So that's what I got. And uh, and thank you all uh, for listening. Thanks, Mike, and I'm uh, glad to be here. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, a ton packed into that session. So thank you very much. I, uh, I took away a lot. I really enjoyed uh, a lot of the visualizations and different ways to present uh, some arguments perhaps we've seen before, but I really appreciated the way you laid it out. That was great. Um, there, I'll, I'll try to squeeze in a couple questions. Um, a, a couple questions are asking around, I think, changes in uh, the GHG intensity of the Ontario electricity grid. Um, uh, uh, some questions are referencing various studies. Some are pointing to uh, shutdown of, of assets like the Pickering nucle nuclear plant. And so perhaps I'll try to summarize that question. Um, what it, a lot of our uh, GHE reductions province-wide have been achieved by those grid scale emission reductions. Um, how, does, how do we make sure that we're forward thinking when we're thinking about electrification and depending even more on the grid for our carbon reductions? Uh, do you want me to do that one, Scott? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, there's two good answers to that. The number one answer is that, the first answer is that by thinking holistically and taking your opportunities to make your building more efficient and you know, doing that sort of optimal fuel switch, we won't hopefully add weight to the grid needs, but you know, beyond what is already going to be needed for electrification of vehicles. So thinking of, and working with the grid operators. But I, I think the truth is really that you know, the projection is that we're going to increase our, uh, it, you know, if the economy grows quickly and we increase our, our electricity use even a little bit, we're going to need, we're going to start using more natural gas. And so we need to have a grid-wide 
decarbonization plan that continues from this point forward as well. It can't just be a building scale plan. And one of the top recommendations that staff gave to the Council of Toronto was you need to work with the province and the ISO on a holistic plan. It can't just be us. And I've heard Brian Purcell from TAF speak pretty eloquently on that as well. His argument is one of his main arguments is the province needs to be just as responsible for the change that's needed now as building owners are, I think. And so and the ISO really in that regard. So, yeah. Yep, I agree. Oh, good answers. Um, there's also a, f a few questions around uh, economics to be able to make these things happen. And so some pointed questions around uh, building enclosure upgrades and how to be able to do those economically. Um, Scott, you touched on a few things throughout the presentation, but maybe you could highlight a couple here. Yeah, the one th uh, I also want to mention, we have not talked about embodied carbon, uh, which buildings, existing buildings represent all the all the emissions that are currently in the environment so by reusing and adapting existing buildings we're already doing a lot to reduce future embodied carbon of new assets um, on the retrofit side for building enclosures the reality is that um, you know existing buildings often present many unknown conditions um, and that can affect cost but we we do have lots of exemplars in, in industry where cost-effective retrofits have been done specifically on on MERBs, uh, multi-unit residential buildings, tall buildings. Um, that is a known process. You know, you seal up the outside, insulate on the exterior and put cladding on it. That's not a highly technical um, exercise. There's, you know, some structural aspects and other detailing things that you have to sort out. But um, I would say some of the bigger challenges are on existing commercial office buildings, a lot of curtain wall systems, and we've done some um, uh, I would call it more overcladding, uh, where we've adapted a new uh, glazed framing system with some pretty significant thermal upgrades into an, a, a system that is secured to the existing framework. So there was a question I saw in the chat about you know reusing existing systems. Um, you know that in that case, the entire curtain wall grid, all the structure, even the back pen and insulation is all still there. So we're reusing all of those materials, which do represent a significant amount of embodied carbon. The other way I talk about retrofits is always on the differential. Buildings are not free. They, they require maintenance and they require repair and they re often require significant amounts of capital just to maintain the like for similar scenario that we that Anthony um, talked about in, in the, the planning, uh, uh, planning ideas. So in a lot of our retrofit work, we often we often make sure that we're comparing to the sort of minimum required maintenance or or maybe the kind of optimal required maintenance um so if you know i'll use one example a commercial office building because there are so many downtown that are in that vintage where many are facing 100 percent igu uh, glazing replacement right um so what's the differential to replace that with a more efficient system um, versus just having to replace the glass as is for the same kind of glass and having no improvements. Um, so you, you have to compare against the, a reasonable baseline. It's not zero or $50 million, it's 35 million or 50 million. And then we're gonna be talking about the differential, right? I'm obviously using maybe extraordinarily high numbers, but you get the picture. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, well, thank you both. I really enjoyed the, the presentation, a uh, really good talk. Um, and there are a lot of other questions, but we are gonna wrap it up. Uh, we're, we're coming to the close of the, the festival. Uh, Anthony and Scott had their contact information up on their final slide there, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you reached out with any uh, further follow-ups. Um, so I wanna thank you both for, for a great presentation. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So I'll move into the closing remarks and we'll just stay in this room to do so. Um, I'm gonna remind you one last time to register for your continuing education credits using the pop-up survey on your screen. And so to further these clo this closing remarks, I want to thank all of our delegates for attending today's presentations and a big thank you to our speakers and presenters. And a special thanks to our festival sponsors and industry partners. Uh, being prompted to give one more reminder about the CEUs. So it doesn't seem like we can forget about the CEUs today. So 
make sure you register for those and the certificates are going to be uh, sent out by email by the end of October. I have to collect those CEUs for a few of my credentials, so I actually do appreciate the reminder. Um, recording of all these sessions are going to be made available within a couple days. Uh, they'll be available until February and all attendees will receive an email when they are available. Finally, I'd really like to thank and acknowledge the Sustainable Buildings Canada team. Uh, a lot of work goes into these conference, uh, conferences and events, and I think it really showed in the quality of the program that we saw today. Uh, a couple specific and special thanks uh, from Black Current Marketing, Rebecca Black and Jen McNitt, and from Sustainable Buildings Canada, Emily Farad, Adam Jones, Melanie Simpson, Bettina Hoar, Samantha Hoar, and Mike Singleton. And a final shout out to Tom Podessa, uh, who once again curated an excellent program this year. So with that, uh, that's the end of the festival. Thank you very much. And I, I hope to actually see you all in 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, until then.